Lord call is Valerian the seasoning. Valerius are as ancient as Targaryens, and according to their own family history, they came to Westeros even before Targaryens did, and that is if you believe their own family record. When the Valerians came to Westeros, they decided to settle on an island called Driftmark, just west of Dragonstone, which later became home to House Targaryen. It's worth mentioning that not all houses of Valyria were dragon riders. And even among dragon riding houses, House Targaryen, for example, was, was considered the middling house. And the only reason they rose to prominence was because one of their daughters foresaw the doom of Valyria and warned her house and they got out of there pronto. Now, back to Valerius. Knowing they could not conquer the heavens, they set out to build their naval force and make water to their dominion. When the Targaryens came to Westeros due to their roots, and proximity, they built strong ties and even family relations later. And when time came for the conquest of Westeros, House Valerian became effectively Aegon's navy. And once Aegon uh, sat on the Iron Throne and created his own council, he made the Lord of Driftmark the master of ships. And the official title he gave him was Lord of the Tides. <laughs> cool name, huh? As you can see, our man Corlys Valerian had big shoes to fill in when he came of age. And by came of age, I mean six, not sixteen or older. That's when he served as a ship hand on one of his uncle's vessels and sailed to Fenton. Although he was noble born and the ships he took voyage on were owned by his family, that did not stop him from working and earning his passage. He did whatever asked of him. He climbed up the crow's nest, he scrubbed the deck, he learned how to navigate and became a sailor in general. Once he learned the ropes, he finally became a captain himself. At age 16, he got his first ship. Not the flashiest boat though, it was just a fishing boat called Cod Queen. I don't know if that is a pun intended on Martin's part. Regardless, he started sailing to whatever port which was worth his name and back in the day merchants had sailed to. And once he was done, he decided that he needed a flagship. And that's when the young Corlys started making a name for himself. He began building his legacy by first designing and building his own uh, flagship. He called it the Sea Snake. The first thing he did once he put Sea Snake into water was to sail farther than anybody else had ever had. Back in the day, the farthest port the merchants would sail to to bring spices and other exotic goods was Car. Remember Car? Uh, the place where the weirdest shit happened in Game of Thrones? Now, he took this risk, but boy was he rewarded for it. He came out with the largest cargo of silk and exotic spices, and overnight, the gold in the coffers of House Valerian doubled. And if you thought after this he would stop taking risks, you would be wrong. The next thing he did was sailing to Asha, you know, the place where Melisand is from, and uh, practically every other shady witch and wizard. Long story short, Corlys Valerian made nine legendary voyages, the last of which was the most profitable one. This mad lad decided for his last voyage, he would empty his coffers, take every last bit of gold coin he had in his chest, and sail to Car on his flagship Sea Snake, buy 20 ships there, and fill all of the holes to the brim with exotic uh, goods. He even brought some elephants. Unfortunately, those chunky boys did not make it and all perished at sea along with six other vessels. Despite the losses, Corlys Valerian made so much money that for a short time, House Valerian became the wealthiest house in Westeros, even uh, above the Lannisters. All these exploits, which were achieved on his ship Sea Snake, would prompt everybody to give him a nickname which proved so fitting later. Corlys Valerian would come to be known as the sea snake. Soon after, the sea snake became lord of the tides, inheriting the title from his grandfather, who surprisingly lived long enough to be 88 before his death. Just like real medieval times, back in the day, especially men did not live that long. For example, 
King Jeharis, who later became to be known as the Old King, didn't even lo live long enough to be seven. But I digress. Once Lord Corlys Valerian became Lord of the Tides, he started on increasing the size of King Jeharis' navy. And by the time the Old King died, the size of his fleet had tripled compared to where Lord Corlys had taken over. Now you might think Lord Corlys was too much of a career man to find the time to court women and find a suitable mate, but you would be wrong. Sea Snake managed to attract the affection of the most powerful bachelor in all of the realm, Rhaenys Targaryen, dragon rider, and the only issue of the heir apparent, Prince Emo. Once they were locked in marriage, they arguably became the third most powerful couple in all of the realm. Uh, third only to the king and queen and his parents-in-law. Good things don't last though and dreams have a fleeting tendency to them. When King Jay discarded Rhaenys' claim in favour of his other son, Valon, Cordes was living. But he and his wife decided to bide their time and wait for the next opportunity to pounce on. And that opportunity came with Baylon's untimely death and the Council of 101, which we already covered in the previous video. Let's think forward to the press. Lord Corlys Valerian is still Lord of the Tides under King Viserys, a capable man who takes care of business and is as loyal as they come. But don't mistake his loyalty as lack of ambition. Although his dream of becoming Prince Consort has been dashed, he still has a cut son who has a legitimate claim to the Iron Throne if it came down to it. Even Lane or his son never gets to sit on the Iron Throne, his sons and his grandsons would still have a legitimate claim. Although when it comes to Lainor's children, one should keep an open mind. Now let's go to the casting of Lord Corlys Valerian for the season. I gotta give it to Steve Buzon. Although he's only been in one episode, and has limited screen time, I'm absolutely convinced that he is a sea snake. Although we won't see that uh, younger version of him, he manages to capture that charisma and that level of respect, the non-verbal uh, authority that he commands whenever he speaks or wherever he is. That demeanor that comes from uh, years of experience and being in absolute positions of power. So yeah, when it comes to him, I have absolutely no gripes with his character, with his uh, casting and anything that, uh, that comes down to his performance. But so far, one thing I would like to see more of him is him on his flagship, the Sea Snake. Because as a seafarer, I doubt he would be comfortable to spend too long on land. Thank you for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed this character deep dive. There is more coming and I hope you enjoy them as well.